Well, good morning, everybody. It is a glorious, beautiful, amazing day here in upstate New York. I hope um, you enjoyed yesterday a, uh, a teaser of what summer was like. Uh, it is no longer, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, today, uh, I have a great uh, privilege of being able to open the word with you. In um, We uh, have been looking at our, our five discipleship outcomes, and this uh, in the season between now and Advent, we are going to be looking at the book of Titus. So um, if you have your Bible with you, I would encourage you to open to the book of Titus. Um, in case you don't know where that is, it's uh, right after 2 Timothy, so 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and then Philemon. Uh, and so you can find it there. And what I want to do is have an opportunity just to kind of give us some context uh, about this book and um, what, why it's being written, what's going on, who is Titus, um, and, and where is he? And then uh, we're going to look at just the first four verses this morning um, to take a look at. And there is, uh, as usual in God's Word, there is a ton there. But I think it is uh, enough. will be enough for us as we take a look at this book this morning. And so, before we uh, look at the word, I want to I want to help us to be able to understand um, what's going on in the book of Titus. And so, this is uh, considered an epistle. Um, it is written by the apostle Paul, who also wrote First and Second Timothy and uh, another dozen books of the New Testament. And it is written to a gentleman by the name of Titus, someone who, whom we know is a uh, faithful disciple and co-laborer uh, with Paul uh, throughout the New Testament. And so you may remember uh, the Apostle Paul, many of us know, but he was formerly Saul, uh, a gentleman who spent his entire life uh, persecuting Christians up until at Acts chapter 9 upon which he himself had a miraculous conversion on uh, the road um, to actually go and persecute other Christians, and Jesus chose himself to him. And he was, uh, at that time, a, a, a practicing Jew, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as we looked at a, a few weeks ago. And he had subsequently, from that moment on, been entrusted by God himself, by, by Christ his Savior, to go and take the gospel not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. Those whom, as he wrote, writes in Ephesians, were outside of the promises of God, without hope. And Christ says, no, you are going to be my chosen instrument to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to the Gentile believers outside of Jerusalem. And this was the command of God. And as we see Paul uh, live that out from, from after Acts chapter 9, we see the rest of Acts and how the church begins to grow and how Paul's um, journeys throughout and, and missionary work begins to, to pop up churches throughout. We see Titus spoken of here throughout um, both um, Acts, but we see him in, in Corinthians specifically, um, and uh, obviously a few times here in the book of Titus. But he's seen about 13 times Titus's name is mentioned throughout the New Testament. But really little is said about him specifically. What we do know about him, and really the, the first chronological mention of him is actually in Galatians chapter 2. And we see that um, Paul here just mentions him by way in Galatians. But we also see that the reason he does so is because when Paul went from Antioch, where he had uh, spent some time, to discuss right, the gospel that he was proclaiming with the leaders in Jerusalem. So he's going from the church of Antioch to the church of Jerusalem to explain this gospel that he is a, as a, a devout, former devout Jew, now um, what we would call a Jew for Jesus, if you will. He brings up Titus, and he actually brings him along as a young man in ministry and puts on display Titus as a, as a perfect example of this, what they were calling at this time, an uncircumcised young Greek believer. And what Paul says is, listen, and this is the whole idea of uh, at that time when he goes to the Jerusalem council that you, know, you have to believe in Jesus and be circumcised in order to be a, a really good believer. And Paul brings Titus and says, well, look at this young man. He's a believer in Christ. He's been converted to the way. And he feels no conviction 
No conviction to be circumcised. He was an example of what it was to be converted as a, as a Gentile to the way of Christianity and say, you know what? Here is a faithful first fruits of my ministry to the Gentiles. Titus, uh, as we continue on in the New Testament, we see that he was regularly back and forth between Corinth many times. And each time Paul comes to Corinth, after Titus has been there, he regularly uh, says this phrase, that things have been set in order because of Titus being there. You know, as I read and, and did a little bit of discovery about Titus this week, I realized that Titus is like the special forces of Paul's ministry. Titus goes to those places that nobody wants to go to. Goes to those really difficult places to put things in order. You know, the church at Corinth, I don't know if you've read through both of the books to uh, the church at Corinth, they had some really difficult things going on. They were, uh, to put it in a common context, they were a really messed up church. They were us. <laughs> Let's be honest. They were the American church. We're, we're messed up. We're difficult. There's a lot of different things going on. And that's where Paul sent Titus. But then he routinely, again, sends him, once he's done there, he sets things in order. This is likely why Paul, then in his missionary journey, leaves Titus in the island of Crete. And that's where, where we find Titus here when we open the book of Titus. This, this book um, that Paul has, has written here, this epistle, letter, if you will, to the church in Crete, a little island there, that Titus has been left at, Paul writes to him. And he writes to him just two years before he dies. And so this letter is, is written to Titus at the, the end of Paul's life, knowing all that he has discovered and learned about Christ, how he's grown in his maturity and faith, knowing that his eyes are getting dim. He's it's getting towards the end of his labor, but he still has such great clarity about who Christ is and ultimately who he is in Christ. And so he writes to Titus at the island of Crete. Now, Crete would have been known as an island with very, uh, the, the, let's put it this way, the, the people of Crete were, lo- were very well known for their very low moral standards. And we're going to see that throughout the book that, that Paul writes about that, that they were, they were known for being a, a very low moral standard um, society there. And so Paul says, listen, we started a church there. Titus, I'm going to leave you there to put in order the things that need to be done there. Now this is, for many, this uh, book is looked to as, uh, could be labeled, I should say, as the, the apostolic manual for church planting. It's a, it's a short three-chapter book, but it is, it is very thick in its, um, what it teaches, and it helps us to begin to understand how do you put things in order at a church on the front lines of the gospel, where it's, the, the gospel is just breaking in. Many say, okay, well, then let's take a look at Titus helps us to see. Because it, the beauty of Titus is that as a book, it, it helps us to look at two things that, that are intertwined with one another. It helps us to look at individuals and how they have God, are, are to have godly living. And then, as individuals have godly living, how the church as a whole, comprised of those people, because remember, the, the, the church is a people, not the building, not the, not the stone, not the castle on the island of Crete. But how does the church then have a godly representation in the world? Brothers and sisters, as God's Word always is, this is ever more relevant for our day. Amen? How do we as individuals live in such a way that we demonstrate godly living? And as well, how do we order the church so that the church as a body puts on a godly display to the world? And so we're going to take a look at this, uh, these first four verses, um, at, which is the introduction. Now, oftentimes, I'll be honest, for many years, I just read an introduction and moved on to the next section. Okay, can we confess that? Yes, 
We do that, we read the introduction, and we go, okay, now to the meat. Titus is the shortest epistle, three chapters. It has the longest introduction of every book that Paul writes, with the exception of Romans. And Romans has got a few more verses on it. But it is the longest introduction. And so we're going to take some time to walk through it. So I would invite you, open up your Bibles, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is the word of the Lord as Paul writes. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, with accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you are our Father in heaven, Lord, who desires to give us so much of yourself, who desires for us to, to know you, to love you, to trust you, and, Lord, for you to ever be present. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the gift of your word that reminds us, teaches us, gives us a guide to, to know you. We thank you, Lord, that you demonstrated that character in and through the person of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, that you took on flesh and came and dwelt among us to show us, Lord, what you are like. Lord, and to walk through every bit of what we walk through on a daily basis. You truly were Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, in the book of Hebrews reminds us that because of that, you are able to empathize with us in every way, knowing the struggles, the difficulties, the anguish, the heartache, the joys, the excitement, and the ever tarry, Lord, of, of this life. Lord, I ask now as we turn to your word that you would help us to see, Lord, that we were created to serve you. Lord, we were created and redeemed, Lord, to be agents for your purposes. Lord, so that we would make you known. Lord, I ask that uh, by your Spirit, you would move us into faithfulness with your Word. Father, we pray now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We begin right where Paul picks up. And what we're going to see this morning is that um, even here in the very first verse, you know, it, it would be easy for us to look at this text and say this is Paul's writing and Paul is this amazing apostle and there's no way that we could ever be equated with him. He writes 14 books of the New Testament. He's just amazing. And yet, if you've read any of Paul, you know that Paul has a right view, a humble view of himself that he was one untimely born and appointed as an apostle. That he desired to do the things he knew he should, but his body couldn't because of his flesh. That he had a thorn in his side, a, an ailment of some sorts that kept him, and, de and that he desired to see relief from, but the Lord says, no, my grace is sufficient. That, and so if we can come to our text this morning and understand that Paul although he writes through the Spirit a good bit of our New Testament, that really he's a man. He is with us, a fellow brother in the Lord, and that he writes from a place of understanding what it is 
again, towards the end of his life here now, to follow the Lord and have great security in him. And so he, he writes in this first um, chapter, or this first verse here, and he, he points out and puts something right in front of us that like Paul, all of us are to serve our Lord. Like Paul, all of us are to serve our Lord. Now, our service is going to look different. I don't think necessarily, maybe the Lord has convinced you of this so far, maybe not, that you are to journey all throughout uh, present-day Turkey and uh, Central Asia, Europe area, and take the gospel into every nook and cranny to people who are not Jews. Anybody feeling that calling yet? Len raises his hand haphazardly. (laughs) Not yet. But like Paul, we have all been called to serve our Lord. And he gives us a couple ways in which we've been called to serve our Lord here in the, in the first four verses. And so we're going we're gonna to kind of walk through them and we see, you know, how has God called us to serve him? How has God called us to serve him? So in what ways? Well, number one, Paul says, Paul, a servant of God. So what the New Testament translators here have done is this is a word that actually means slave, doulos. And um, they translate it depending on the context. But we all, like Paul, have been called to be servants or slaves of our God. Right? So Paul here identifies himself, as he does in many places, a servant or a slave of God. Often he says, I'm a slave to Christ. He's redeemed me. But... Paul understands that there's no difference between God and Christ. He, he demonstrates his thorough understanding that, that they are one in the Trinity. He recognizes that he was bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ, as he tells us in 1 Peter 1, 19. And so because of that mindset, he recognizes that he is no longer his own. That he was redeemed by the blood of Christ. He was purchased out of the slavery of sin and is now a slave to God. And so one of the ways in which we we recognize that we serve our Lord is that we we are indebted to Him for what He has done for us. He's redeemed us and reconciles us. And and Paul here, not out of of duty or obligation, but out of great joy and and reverence for what God has done, does Paul say, I'm a servant to Him. It shows us the humility, really, that, that should characterize our lives as servants. We should be characterized our lives as servants. Jesus reminds His disciples, it is not, I have not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. And so we are to model that in ways that we are to serve our Lord here. Uh, the, the, the next way that, that Paul highlights that we are to serve our Lord is as those who are sent. Notice all the S's here. I'm, I'm being a, a really good alliteration this morning, okay? S. You're sent. What, what does it mean to be sent? Paul says, and I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the the term apostle, we uh, largely associate with those 12 who walked with Jesus. And they were those who were the 12 disciples who witnessed the life, the death, the the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. They give um, credence to uh, firsthand knowledge of Jesus. Uh, But it's not just a a title, a a technical term that that labels those 12, but in, in sense, it's also a general term. And so what we would say is that Apostle, capital A, is the title, and that is only for those 12. No one else after that, okay? The the office, if you will, of Apostle is closed. There were only 12. That was it. But Paul recognizes that he was one, kind of an anomaly. He he writes in 1 Corinthians 15.8 that, I'm an apostle, one untimely born outside of the normative piece of what God has done, and he desired to use me to send me to the Gentiles. So although he was not a capital A apostle, he was one who had seen Jesus on the road, had been in his presence, and had been then sent to take the gospel. And that's really what what apostolic means, uh, uh, to be an apostle apostolic or apostolically sent is is really to one who is sent 
Okay, so if we send a missionary, if we send Mike Davis to Scotland and support him, where he's one who is sent, apostolically going, okay, taking the gospel to the ends, or if you will, to the front lines, where one side knows the gospel, the other side does not yet. And so Paul recognizes that one of the ways that we as his people serve him is in, is in an apostolic way. We are taking the gospel to places where it hasn't been before. You're taking the gospel to your jobs at UPS. You're taking them to, your jo- to the places that you uh, frequent, like Starbucks. You're taking them to, to work and to your neighborhood. Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the fact that God has called us to be on mission with Him, the Missio Dei, God taking His proclamation of the gospel into all the earth through you. And so really, this speaks to our calling and and our authority as, as missionaries to God. We're those who are apostolically sent. So like Paul, the way in which we serve the Lord is as those who are sent with the message of reconciliation, as he writes in 2 Corinthians 5. All right, third, the, the way that which another way in which we serve the Lord is as those who have been selected. As those who are selected. Paul writes and says, For the sake of the faith of God's elect. So he speaks to really his purpose, Paul's purpose as an apostle. So first he mentions two things that, that seem at odds with one another. You may read past that sentence and go, okay, no big deal. But there really are two things that, that seem at odd, but at odds with each other. But can I be honest with you? They're two really good friends. So we look here. We see that Paul says, I exist for the faith. The faith. Now, faith comes through hearing and hearing by the preached word. And so we see that this idea of, of faith is a, is a human responsibility. We have to, we have, we respond in faith and repentance to the gospel. We respond in faith in Christ for all that he has done. But then he also says, not just for the sake of the faith, of who? Of God's elect. Uh-oh. That doesn't seem, wait, hold on a minute. That, that speaks to God's Elect certain people that he has set apart. It's this idea and this doctrine of, of God's divine election. And really, what we see here is that this is God's divine sovereignty. God has ordained those who would come to know him. Do I understand it fully? No, but I understand that my God does so in a way that does not violate human response and our. <coughs> Excuse me. And the way in which we respond to him. And see, Paul doesn't see a contradiction here. Salvation from beginning to end is the sovereign work of God's grace, as he writes in Ephesians, and even the writer of Hebrews says in 12:2. And yet no one will be saved who does not repent and believe, and all who repent and believe will be saved, as, as Romans 10:13 tells us. I think the great prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, writes so beautifully about this. And when he is asked on how he reconciles these two doctrines of of really human responsibility of faith and, and God's election and his divine sovereignty, he writes this. My dear brethren, I quote, I never reconcile two friends. Never. These two doctrines are friends with one another. For they are both in God's word, and I shall not attempt to reconcile them. End quote. I think Spurgeon is aptly pointing out that there are, two, there are things in the midst of the scripture that cause us tension, and we're okay to live in those things. Do I understand them all fully? No, but the scripture teaches them fully. Amen? And so we rest and say, I shall not reconcile two friends, but I'll trust in the one who sovereignly and divinely put all these things together. And I'll trust him that I have to respond in faith and that there are those whom are going to come to faith. Now, far too often, I think that because of this idea of election, God knows there are those who will respond to his message that there are some who say, well, then why do we have to share the gospel? 
I mean, if God already knows who's coming to Him, what's the point? Well, can I tell you that the doctrine of election does not negate our responsibility to faithfully proclaim the gospel to the lost. In fact, all the more, it is now our responsibility to make sure that the seeds are spread forth. We are not responsible for whether they take root. We are not responsible for whether they grow. But we have a great responsibility to cast the seed and spread the good news of the gospel. And to that, the scripture is clear of. And so we are forever to be faithful, to be planting and planting and planting and planting. And whether it grows is between the Lord and that individual. Always. So God has called us to serve Him as those who are selected. All right, lastly, the last way in which God has, has uh, in which we are to serve the Lord is as those who are sanctified. As those who are sanctified. Look, in the second part of one, he says, and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. You see, the faith of those who belong to God has a purpose. Saving faith moves us into a full knowledge of the truth. See, we didn't fully understand all of the truth of the Scripture until we came to know God and we began to know it. Anybody here know the fullness of the knowledge of the truth of God yet? Yeah, me neither. But we're growing in it. So we're growing as, as we gain knowledge of the truth of who God is and what He has done and the truth of the Gospel and our submission to God as our Lord in our lives should lead us to grow in godliness. See, our faith and our, our knowledge of the truth lead us to grow in godliness, to grow in our righteousness, to grow, to be more like Him, to grow into the image of God, to grow in our fruit of the Spirit. See, what we believe affects how we live. And how I live should demonstrate how I believe. Do you see those two things here? There is no such thing as right belief apart from right living. And there's no such thing as right living apart from right belief. They are one, two sides of the same coin. And ultimately, this speaks to our maturity in Christ. That is, those who serve the Lord, we're growing in our maturity. We're growing in our what we call sanctification, the big word that the Scripture uses here. We're, we're growing in that maturity. A child grows to maturity. Many of us wish that was sooner rather than later. But part of the reason that, that we help them to, to learn what it is to do the dishes, to, to, to learn to do their laundry, to, to take responsibility, to have things around the house that help, help them grow to realize that one day mom and I will not be there to do the dishes. And I don't want them sitting there at 18, 25, or 40 going, how do I do these? I don't know how to do these. Well, do you know how they know how to do that? We grow them in maturity. By helping them along with it. Teaching them in it. How do I know how to take responsibility to grow in that maturity? By practicing it. By being taught it. And the Christian life is the same. The child of God is to live in a sanctified, holy, pure, and godly way. And by doing that, we put the genuineness of the truth of the gospel on display for everyone to see. That doesn't mean necessarily that because we're older in age that we are more mature christian maturity looks different it's not just a how long are you seasoned for that makes christian maturity no the measure of maturity is seen in the, the evidence of, of the fruit of the spirit in the midst of our lives and how we steward it and in how in our pursuit of god and how we utilize our gifts towards everyone else in the midst of the body in the world. And maturity is measurable not by just age, but by evidence in the life of an individual. All right, so here we see that as servants of God, we exist both for the salvation of the lost and growth in godliness in the life of us as believers. 
So Paul tells us, okay, this is how we are to serve the Lord. And, and then he transitions. He gives us another way. He says, listen, not just to serve the Lord, but like Paul, the reason he can, he begins to root our service. How, come, how can we serve God unwaveringly, un, in, in a way that's just un, unleashed? He says, you can do that because we have security in the Lord. Like Paul, we have security in the Lord. See, Paul recognizes that radical service to the Lord had to be rooted somewhere. Otherwise, what would happen is that that would easily fall over. We've seen this, right? We see trees that are shallowly rooted and they easily fall over. Anybody have a few things fall over this week with all the wind and craziness going on? We've seen signs, mostly political signs in this season, shallowly rooted and fallen over because of the wind. Maybe there's a political metaphor there. I don't know. but So Paul, what he says here is he, he deeply roots this radical call to service in the hope of eternal life that finds its certainty. Hear this. Eternal life finds its certainty in the character of God. And that's what he says here in verses 2 and 3. Two avenues for sure and certain security. So like Paul, we have security in the Lord. Well, like Paul, we have security in the Lord. Look what he says. Number one, this is the the first way in which we have security in the Lord. Look at verse 2, what he says. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began. What? What? See, there's a chain reaction here that's going on, and we've, we've almost reached the, the moment where everything on the chemistry table just kind of goes... We see this chain reaction that saving faith of those who belong to God leads to knowledge of truth, which leads to godliness. End of, chapter, end of verse 1. And all of this rests, looks forward to, in great anticipation, and in looking for the hope of eternal life in God who cannot lie. Consider that promise. If you come today as those in here or listening and wonder, what is the hope I have? It is an eternal promise of God who cannot lie. That should bring us great security and rest. You see, hope is a confident certainty and expectation of something that is not yet ours, but will be. Okay? Right? So when I say I hope that the Seahawks win the Super Bowl, really not a single amen, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Golly. It's a, I have a confident certainty and an expectation of something to come, but I do not yet know that that will be mine. But when I say, that Jesus will come back and take His bride and there will be a day when there is no more need for the Son because the eternal dwelling place of man of, of God is among men and I will sing His praise forevermore and I have hope in that moment. It will come. I have great hope in that and there is certainty there. We have hope in that eternal life. And that's both a quantity forever amen but also a quality forever christ in you with you in his presence and all of our hope is rooted deeply in the character and integrity of god i thought about i have 50 yes 50 black walnut trees on one side of my house one side of my yard, and they are both amazingly beautiful and the biggest pain in the, same, in the same bit. But you cannot get rid of a root. Do you know why? Because they have a tap root, one that is right in the middle, and it goes down deep, deep, deep. And there is not one bit of wind that causes those trees to waver. I never worry about those trees falling over. The ash tree, not so much. They are deeply rooted. Here we see in this text an allusion to what we call the covenant of redemption. That before the beginning of time, God made a covenant in where the Father was going to show His love for His Son by promising a redeemed people who would love, serve, and glorify Him together. 
And we see that in John chapter 6 and John 17, this, this people that would forever be to love, serve, and glorify God forever. But we also see the, the other side of that covenant is that the Son showed His love for the Father by becoming the Lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world, as 1 Peter 1 tells us. You see, this entire promise, this entire covenant was, as Peter, or Paul writes here, before the ages began. My brothers and sisters, this is a great eternal promise that before eternity pa- present, in eternity past, before the ages begin, God planned for us. Our salvation was not an afterthought for God. It was not, as I say, plan B. He planned it down to the last detail. Therefore, we can have great security and confidence in our salvation. If you had any doubt coming into this room today or clicking on the link this morning or listening online later on, make no mistake, this text right here, the God who does not lie, promised the hope of eternal life before eternity. That should bring us great hope and security this morning. But it's not just through His witness that God provides us security. Through His witness, and that's what we just talked about. God's given security through His witness, as is through His character, as one who does not lie. But secondly, He does it through His Word. Through His Word. And so this is the next crucial link in this, in this chain reaction in which God, the manifestation of God's truth is seen in His Word, which is why we profess that God's Word is not only inerrant, but it is also sufficient for all of faith, life, and godliness. It is without error. It is fully true. It is trustworthy because God does not lie and this is His Word. Therefore, it is enough. This eternal love letter that gives us every opportunity to know every facet of God that we can fathom in our infinite minds is given to us. Now, it's not only given to us, but Paul here says, and at the proper time, God manifested in His Word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted. And so Paul's talking about himself, but at the same time, he's talking about us. We have been entrusted with the Word of God. And to always be ready to give an account for what we believe. God just didn't give us His Word so that we could have great assurance and confidence and trust in it and say, look, over there, there it is. That's great. I can trust in it. But to be to give that to others. God didn't give us grace in Jesus so we could rest in comfort. He gave us grace in Jesus so that we could be givers of grace to others. The same is true for His Word. He gave us His Word so that we could give it to others. You know what? Your neighbor, your coworker, your friends, they don't need more of you. They need more of God's Word. And God, Paul here is reminding those in, here in, in Crete and us as well that we can have security in the Lord because of His Word. The message we share is not our own, but it's His Word. His commands, and it is our Savior. All right, so Paul says, okay, we, like Paul, we, can, we are to serve. Like Paul, we have security. But then lastly, here in verse 4, he says this, like Paul, we are set apart unto the Lord. Paul understood that um, like him, we have been set apart unto the Lord. Verse 4, he writes this, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. So here we get both, okay, the letter is written to Titus, but would have been read, read in the whole of the church. So we, we meet Titus here. But he says some very interesting things about Titus. He calls him a true child. And now he only speaks about Timothy in this way as well, as one uh, that really speaks to the fact that they are a true child in a, in a common faith, that they are brothers in arms. And, and for Paul, here he is in about 62 AD. He's riding near the end of his life. He looks at Titus, who's a relatively young man, I would assume probably around my age, or maybe a little bit younger, and says, you are a true child in the faith. A testimony 
that they carried the same gospel. You see, his hearers, Titus would have read this in the whole of the congregation, and people listening would have thought, oh, Titus is a true child in a common faith with Paul. I know the message of Paul. I know the gospel that was preached by Paul. I know what Paul believes. Therefore, if Titus is a true child of his, I can trust that word. You see, he's writing that they share a common faith. And not just him and Titus, but many others throughout Ephesus, Galatia, Corinth, all over Colossae. We are set apart under the Lord as those who share a common faith. We share a common faith with other gospel preaching churches. This is one of those areas where I then say, hey, this is why we have something like CNY One Church. Because we share a common faith, not just in this room, but as a part of the whole body of Christ. This is what what Jude says was uh, the truth that was delivered to the saints once for all. We have a common faith. But then secondly, he finishes his intro with grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. Easy to just sweep right over it. But what we see here, if we've been set apart as part of God's family, look at God the Father. You see, when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, we also receive God as Father. You see, the title Savior appears 12 times in the New Testament. Six of them are in Titus. The title Savior, 12 times in the New Testament, six of them in Titus. God as Savior and Jesus as Savior are both mentioned three times. There is something that Paul desires to get across to Crete, to through Paul, and even to us today, that God and Christ, they are our Saviors, but that together as God sends the Son and this covenant of redemption, as the Son glorifies God and, and does His work, that we are brought into a family of believers. Paul here makes no bones about the fact that God and Christ are one and that we've been united to this family. And if you are united to this family, because we are family, a couple things. We are loved by God. You are accepted, not condemned. You are loved and cared for. And that you have been redeemed by Christ. He is your brother, whoever sits at the right hand of the Father to intercede on your behalf. Would, could anybody ask for a better older brother who always takes responsibility for your failures? I'm the oldest of three. I would never do that. But you have one. We have one. It's Jesus Christ. Flowing from that is grace and peace. Unmerited favor, grace on one hand. Favor you don't deserve. The older brother recognizes you don't deserve that. But he gives it anyway. And then a peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace from God. Jesus says, I I leave you peace, but not as the world gives you peace. I leave you peace that calms the soul, comforts the heart. As we finish this morning, we recognize that as Paul writes these short four verses, that grace inspires godliness. Salvation inspires service. That those who understand that that God's love for them and His desire for their salvation originates in eternity past. And it continues through eternity future. As we are those who understand these things, we will be compelled to love Him and to serve Him. Not out of obligation, but out of gratitude. And that's really my question for you today as we close. Are you serving God out of obligation? Are you here, seated, attending out of obligation because it's just what what Christians do? Or are you here because of gratitude, true gospel gratitude? You see, a man who is captured by the love of his wife 
returns the love, not because he has to, but because he wants to. A person captured by the love of Christ will love him in return, not because he has to, but because they want to. Christ saved us that we might serve him. And he saved us that we might enjoy him forever. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you now and thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, a word that has set us apart, a word that is a comfort to us, a word that reminds us of your truths and gives us great comfort. Lord, help us remember, Lord, that you have not only saved us, Lord, but that you have sent us and redeemed us to live a sanctified life to glorify you. Lord, and that you give us your word to remind us of the security that we have in you. Lord, and that the call of Scripture is not perfection, but is to live a life set apart for the sake of of your glory in this place. Father, may it be so in, the, in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.